Ranjit Bhar Thakur, distinguished dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to the 12th Eastern Himalaya Naturonomics Forum. It is indeed a privilege for me to be here today at this unique forum that has for the past 12 years brought people together from different walks of life and varied disciplines. <coughs> from corporates, conservationists, social entrepreneurs, grassroots communities, students and custodians of the natural assets. All of us are here today by a single mission of conservation and recognition of the interdependence of nature and economics. I've had the good fortune of knowing Ranjit for a while and very impressed with his vision for the Bali Bharat Foundation. No doubt Ranjit wears many hats as he traverses boardrooms to tea gardens to the cricket field. But his true calling has been that of a social entrepreneur and change agent. The forum and the work at Balipura Foundation is truly reflective of an adage, think global, act local. Baku and Azerbaijan may get the headlines, but Balipara is where community-based approach to conservation has demonstrated the way forward, giving us hope on how best we navigate the looming crisis of climate change, loss of biodiversity, and other critical ecosystems. I have to admit, given the impressive lineup of speakers with deep domain expertise at this conference, it may not be unusual for you to wonder what a commercial banker is doing here at this forum and delivering an opening address. For me personally, there is so much to learn from all the experts and more importantly, from local communities who are being empowered to take forward the critical care of our natural assets. Yet drawing upon my 39 long years in the banking industry, I would say with some confidence that I do understand why I am here and carry a fiduciary responsibility that entails with the profession. I do re recognize the implications of systemic risks and perils of ignoring early warning signals. With our world being in a state of prima crisis, risk management and mitigation has to be the center and core of any activity undertaken. And here's where my banker's instincts really come into play. When one looks at risk, they generally get bucketed into known and unknown. Risk or a combination thereof. For instance, when we had the pandemic, it was an unknown unknown. Climate and nature-related risk, on the other hand, are known unknowns. Here we know the risk, but we don't know is exactly when and with what intensity it may occur. What is more concerning is the deep interconnectedness of these risks on the ecology, economy, livelihood, health, among several other factors. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change now estimates the quantum of climate finance needed by developing countries till 2030 to be upwards of US dollars 6 trillion. This is exponentially higher than what was envisaged in 2020. It is evident the cost of inaction far outweighs the cost of action. And that's the reason why we are all here today to collectively share ideas, learn from each other, and work on solutions which could protect our planet. Climate change and biodiversity loss hurt the vulnerable segments the most. This is the segment that is most likely not to have climate resilient homes, nor access to insurance or pension, and are most vulnerable to health hazards. We are witnessing how climate change has fueled food prices. 
According to the RBI, between 2016 and 2020, the average food inflation was 2.9%, and during the 20s, the food inflation has averaged 6.3%. As we speak today, the latest reading is 10.9. This, amongst others, attribute to multiple supply shocks due to climate events. Persistent high inflation results in a cost of living crisis. Arresting the impact of climate change and protecting our natural resources is core to attaining India's ambition of being a US dollar 30 trillion economy by 2047 under Vixit Bharat. The degradation of nature makes economies, companies, and financial institutions more vulnerable, especially in emerging markets. Banks are the backbone of the financial system, given the dominant role they continue to play. They, however, face a dual challenge of adopting novel approaches to managing climate and nature-related financial risks and enabling much-needed finance for adaption and mitigation. Another challenge is a lack of a well-defined classification system of green activities, which often inhibits financial markets from accurately pricing climate risk and identifying financing opportunities. As for the World Bank's Finance and Prosperity Report 2024, only 10% of emerging and developing economies have sustainable finance taxonomics in place versus 76% for advanced economies. In India, the Honorable Finance Minister in the last budget announced that the government is working on a green taxonomy which would help propel the green transition. Supplementing this, the central bank is also expected to finalize guidelines on climate-related financial disclosures. Loss of ecosystem service could impact sectors like agriculture, fisheries, industries dependent on forestry production, amongst others. This, in turn, could have spillover effects on credit, market, and operational risk for the financial sector and, in turn, for the real economy. The path forward is clear. Banks and financial institutions will have to play a meaningful role in climate and nature-related adaption and its mitigation projects. For this, environment and social due diligence must form a part of any lending or investment activity. Let me now shift gears to the core theme of this forum, the future of the Third Pole and the Eastern Himalayas. In the mainstream narrative, one certainly hears a lot about the North and South Polar regions and declining sea ice in the Arctic and Antarctic. But what is equally critical is the Third Pole, which is a vast region spread from Tibet to the Indian Ocean, rich in its biodiversity, but equally fragile under the threat due to ecological change. So why is the third pole so important to us? First, is its proximity. The region is our home. From the towering mountains to the lush valleys, there exists here an unparalleled wealth of life. One third of South Asia's forests and one twelfth of the world's biodiversity is housed in this very region. The treasure trove is instrumental in regulating global climate patterns, especially in South Asian monsoons, and maintaining economic system stability. Second, the region is Asia's largest freshwater reserve, often called a water tower, that feeds some of the world's most important rivers, sustaining agriculture, industry, and communities far beyond the region itself. A staggering 3 billion people in Asia, a 37% of the world's population, depend on the third pole's water resources. Today, the world's economic growth is powered by Asia, 
and incremental growth in the world's population will predominantly be from Asia. So prevention of these water resources is not about a choice, it's a necessity. The science has been telling us over the years now that the region is warming at a pace that is considerably faster than other regions, touching 1.3 degrees of warming. This in turn causes accelerated glacial melt, dramatically altered precipitation patterns from floods to desertification, coupled with several erratic monsoon patterns. If not arrested, the likelihood is a situation of net water scarcity. And the last thing that we want is water wars. Despite the lurking danger to our ecosystem, I would like to believe that we do have it in us to bring about the right change for our ecosystem that are nearest to us. Solutions are there if we change our mindsets, work collaboratively for the common goal, and tap into the right resources. Nothing fuels change more than a can-do spirit and optimistic mindset. There are invaluable lessons to learn from the Das Gupta review on the economics of biodiversity. Simply put, we have to look at natural ecosystems through the lens of demand and supply economics. Currently, ecosystem services are being consumed at a pace that is significantly faster than the supply being regenerated. This certainly needs to be reversed. Further, models of economic growth need to incorporate a valuation for natural capital whilst also building inclusive societies. We need widespread adoption of policies that increase investments in nature-based solutions and incentivizes nature regenerative businesses. Ecosystem protection and restoration are critical of mitigating economic loss which, for example, includes forest restoration upstream, thereby reducing flood damage downstream of protecting agricultural productivity and yields by moving towards climate resilient forms of agriculture. Another valuable lesson is never underestimate the power of local knowledge. The communities here possess generations of insights and deep understanding of the natural systems. These communities should always be at the heart of our efforts. It is essential that we provide them resources, technology, and above all, respect, empowering them to protect their ecosystem and their heritage. Focusing on youth who live in these regions and ensuring access to quality education skill development and vocational training in green entrepreneurship will go a long way in this objective. India has to harness its demographic dividend to increase productivity and growth. Lastly, there is a need for increased financial resources to build environmental and climate resilience to benefit the communities. Though green finance is still at a nascent stage in India, this market is poised to grow significantly in the near future. Before I conclude, I do want to take the opportunity to share with you some perspectives of HDFC Bank in terms of our endeavors in the Northeast region and our philosophy behind the work we do on corporate social responsibility. Inclusive banking is an area that I have been extremely passionate about. This also entails fulfilling financial inclusion objectives of both the state and central government. I know this work is particularly hard, but we remain committed to deepening our footprint across the country and especially in the Northeast region. For CSR, we try to ensure we have a pan-India presence and endeavor to reach out to remote areas where the needs are the most. HDFC Bank's Parivartan, which essentially means change, is the bank's umbrella brand for all its social initiatives 
and largely focuses on skill development and livelihood enhancement, financial literacy and inclusion, healthcare and hygiene, education and rural development. This year marked the 10th year of our flagship CSR program. As a responsible and socially <coughs> conscious corporate, there is immense satisfaction that our cumulative CSR spend of rupees 51 billion has been able to positively impact over a hundred million lives. Our CSR work in the seven sister states and one brother entails our large scale flagship program, Social and Transformative Rural Economic Empowerment, which transforms self help groups to income generating producer organizations, largely empowering women farmers and artisans. Other CSR initiatives in the Northeast region include establishing facilities for processing solid waste, installation of solar lights, smart classrooms, drinking water facilities, youth skilling, and forest restoration. To conclude, I want to thank each one of you for your dedication to this cause. Let us reaffirm our commitment to preserving this remarkable region. Together, work towards a future where the third pole remains a thriving symbol of resilience and wonder, a source of inspiration for all. In life, we all learn, earn, and return. Thank you.